I want to start out our time. A Facebook post came across my uh, came across my feed the other day uh, from a classmate of mine by the name of David Sorn. He he's the lead pastor of a church called Renovation Church uh, just outside of Minneapolis, St. Paul, in the Twin Cities. He was a classmate of mine in seminary. Um, I was in seminary for five years in an evening program, and I got to know David. He graduated before I did. Um, I graduated in a five-year program. He did in a three. Um, he planted his own church, and this church grew from just a very small house group to a church of well over 1,000 per weekend, and he, uh, to him, it's just like a, a dream every single, every single day, and he wrote this post the other day, and it just, it really hit me, and it ties in with what we're going to be looking at today. And you'll see how in a bit. He said this, I, I don't want to quote him wrong, he said, the other day, I wrote my college professor and thanked him for giving me a C on my very first college paper. And then another C, and another after that. He even sent me to the writing center so that I could learn how to better organize my thoughts. After flying through high school with hardly any critiques on my writing or speaking, getting a C was a major shock. I remember being extremely frustrated because I had never gotten a C in my life, let alone two or three, and I certainly had never been asked to go to tutoring. And yet now, two decades later, I'm so thankful that someone pushed me hard to become better writer and communicator. In my job, I literally have to write the equivalent of a nine-page paper for every Sunday message. And how I organize my thought matters a lot. I'm blessed to have the amazing opportunity to teach God's Word and present the gospel every week. And I want to do it well and in a way people can understand and follow. And I know for a fact that I wouldn't be doing it as well, if Dennis Beach, my professor at St. John's, wouldn't have stopped me in my tracks and forced me to get a better job years uh, to, to do a better job years ago, and then he continued on to thank all the teachers in his life and this and that. And I really started to think about that in terms of what we're looking at today, because unbeknown to Mr. Beecher, to Mr. Beach, excuse me, to his influence on David. I don't know if David would have been able to win souls for Jesus Christ the way he does. I mean, he started a church. It's grown huge. But more important than that, besides the number of people they have coming every week, over thousands of people have come to Christ through David's ministry. And thousands of people have been baptized in the Lord Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit through David's ministry. Praise God, right? And you can thank Mr. Beach in a small part of that because he played a role in helping David become a better communicator. What we do, what we say matters in this world. It matters to others. It matters to God. And it matters to the kingdom of God. But sometimes, though, in life, we don't see ourselves as somebody that matters. We don't see the role that God would want us to play. Sometimes we doubt ourselves. Sometimes we wonder, well, who am I? What am I to be about? Why am I here anyway? These proverbial age-old questions, right? You know, big or small, and I don't necessarily mean <laughs> physically, <laughs> but stature-wise, right? Big or small, whether we're a statesman or we're a shepherd, and anybody and everybody in between. People down throughout the ages, across cultures, across the nations and languages, have all asked questions like these. Who am I? Why am I here? What am I to be about? Well, today we're going to go back to that story of Moses. The story of Moses' first encounter with God where he essentially asked God that very same question. So with that, let's... Open up our Bibles. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 3. We're going to hear this passage one more time. And as we put the words on the screen, I'm going to ask you not just to only listen to it again, even though we just heard it in our first lesson, but I want you to notice how God is being spoken to and how God is speaking in the names of the Lord, how he is being dressed, and the person, the name of God that is the one doing the speaking. Does that make sense? I want you to look for those. 
Okay, here we go. Back to Exodus chapter 3, if we can get the Bible open. Here we go. Okay. So one day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jezreel, the priest of Midian. And he had led his flock far into the wilderness, and he came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord, notice that, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of the bush. And Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't the bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called him from the middle of the bush. Moses. Moses. Here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries and distress because of the harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. Let's pause it right there. I'm going to grab my, my water here, but did you notice... There are two different ways that the Lord is being described, two different, two different ways he's being spoken to or being referred to, I guess you could say. The first is, is in a generalized sense. The word God, the name God. Capital G, O-D. In Hebrew, they omit the letter O because they are afraid to actually say the whole name of God. This is a general terminology that we use for God and, and how it is in the Bible as well. And that word in Hebrew is Elohim. You've heard that before. But it's good for us to know that there are other Elohim in the Bible. There are lower Elohim, if you will. Sometimes in the Bible... The word Elohim is used in a plural sense, and it can mean other deities, gods with a small g, like the god of the Amorites, the god of the Perizzites, the god of the Hivites, the gods of like Asherah and Baal. Okay, so you, you get the point. It can also be used in terms of God's heavenly counsel or of angels or demons. So that's Elohim. And then we see the word for Lord. It's almost always, in this case, it is always capitalized in English. Sometimes it's in all caps, depending on, on how you're reading it. And this word in Hebrew, it's a word that you've heard before. It's Yahweh. And Yahweh is the proper name of God. As my proper name is Jason Douglas Bonnickson or Jason Bach, the Lord God in heaven, Yahweh, is his proper name, right? And Yahweh is the proper name of the Elohim who called Moses atop the mountain. And in verse 15, as we will later hear, God said that, Elohim is his eternal name, a name to remember for all generations. So it's kind of like this. When we're just talking of God in a general sense, thinking of God in a general way, it's awful, often the Elohim that we are thinking of, not a Elohim, but the Elohim that we are thinking about. 
But when we are speaking of God in a personal way and what God means to us or what God has done for us, that is Yahweh, the Elohim that we are thinking about. And Elohim, Yahweh, wants to spend an eternity with us. He is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is the God of family, the God of relationships, and he is the one who calls you into a new life because he wants to spend an eternity with you in heaven above. And so true to Yahweh's character and his namesake, he is love and he is goodness. He is kind, he is merciful. He is abounding with grace. And he showed himself to Moses. And eventually he called Moses friend. And he is the great I am who sent his only begotten son to save us from our sins. And in this encounter that we hear here with Moses, with the Lord Yahweh, we hear a conversation that's really relational. So much so that when Moses doubts himself he, and asks God, well, who am I? The Lord responded with grace, with encouragement. We hear that in verses 11 through 14. Let's go back and hear that. Listen to Moses' doubts, his complaints, his insecurities, and then how God responds. But Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And then notice how God answered. He said, I'll be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this very mountain. But Moses protested. If I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they're going to ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? And God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. You can hear Moses' doubts, his insecurities, but also his humility Echo down through the ages in ways that maybe sometimes we even think of ourselves, right? I can hear Moses thinking to himself, kind of asking himself as God is saying this to him, going, what qualifies me for such a mission? I'm not the statesman I once was. Or maybe Moses was thinking, Pharaoh isn't going to deal with just anybody. He won't see me as a brother anymore or definitely as a statesman anymore. Why, Lord, would you want to send me back there? Think about this. When, when Moses was a prince in Pharaoh's court, Moses would have seen himself as a somebody. And Pharaoh would have seen him as a somebody as well. But this is 40 years later. 40 years of humble living, 40 years of a simpler life, 40 years of aging and growing in wisdom. And Moses might not have seen himself as important as he once did or important enough in his own eyes for the God of the universe to call upon him. And you know what? That's a mistake that way too many of us make. We don't see ourselves as important enough for God to be able to be ever use. We're like, I'm not a somebody. I'm a nobody. Ain't nobody know me. Why would God ever want to use me? We ask ourselves these questions. We might not verbally say them out loud to one another, but we're human. We all have insecurities. We think them. We're no different than Moses. It's a mistake we all make. But we hear how God responds. 
because God wanted Moses to know who he really was and who he was destined to become in the Lord. And so knowing he had doubts, knowing he had anxieties, knowing Moses didn't want to go back, God said two things. The first thing we heard is God saying, I'll be with you. Jesus said he'd never leave us, nor forsake us, nor abandon us. It's the same concept. God is saying to Moses, I'm not going anywhere, Moses. I'm going to be right with you all the way through this whole thing. Moses, you might not see me, but I will be there. I will be with you. He knew that Moses didn't want to go back and confront his past life or confront Pharaoh. He was afraid. The second thing that God was telling Moses was that he really, really, really knew him inside and out, every fabric of his being. We can hear that when we dig beyond our English language into the words, to the response that God said to Moses when he said, I am who I am when Moses asked, well, who shall I say is the one sending me? And God answered, I am who I am. Now, in English, we hear that and we go, well, okay, I believe you, God. But our English language just doesn't do it justice in any way, shape, or form. It often doesn't. In their culture, in their time, and in their language, God is saying to the people, I am the one who sees you. I am the one who was. I am the one who is. And I am the one who will come again. I am the one who has caused everything to happen. I am the one who is causing everything to happen now. And I am the one who is going to cause everything to happen in the future. Moses, I have caused you to happen. It's a knowing that goes beyond the knowing. God is saying, I am the unchanging one who's caused you to become that which I need you to be, Moses. It's the kind of knowing that Jeremiah spoke of when he hears the word, the, the, the word of the Lord say to him, before I ever formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. King David wrote about the Lord's knowing in this intricate manner when he wrote in the Psalms, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Think about how humbling that is. We are born. We die. And for us, there are a finite amount of moments in between. How many ever thousands, millions, billions they may be. The Lord sees them all. He ordains them all. He knew us before this ever happened, before God ever laid the foundations of the universe way over here. He knew you. He knew every hair on your head or lack thereof. He knew every thought you would think, everything you would ever do, everything you would ever say, every step you would take, every move you would make. That was completely ad hoc, Alan. God loved the police. God knows us that intimately, that intricately. And he was saying to Moses, I know you, Moses. He knew Moses so well, and in that same way, he knows you that well too. I mean, think about this. The Lord was the one who protected did Moses from the innocents, the slaughter of the innocents, and rescued him from the Nile. God then orchestrated the events that placed Moses in Pharaoh's court to raise him as a son of Pharaoh, so that Moses could learn how to be an Egyptian, to learn how to be a statesman, to, to think, to act, to like a Pharaoh. 
so that he could one day go back and speak with Pharaoh as an Egyptian statesman and as one who was on the same level as Pharaoh. And the Lord was also the one that put into place the events that caused Moses to be brought from a place of being a statesman to a place of a shepherd. He brought into him a state of of humility and simplicity. You think about what God caused in Moses' life. Born a slave, who then became a statesman and a master of slaves (coughs) to eventually become a shepherd that became the freer of slaves. God needed Moses to understand that his identity wasn't to be found in Pharaoh's court, to be found in the, the Lord's court. The Lord needed Moses to understand that he was way more than the child of any earthly king, but that he was the child of the everlasting king. So that he could one day go back to Egypt's king and say, I am a child of the great I am. And the I am has sent me here to tell you that you must let his people go. See, Moses wasn't only destined to be an adopted son of an earthly king, he was destined to be the son of an everlasting king and the shepherd of God's people who would lead them out of captivity. Let's make this applicable. Because you're thinking, Moses was a somebody. He wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And Moses, Moses was Moses, right? Well, I want you to hear this because just as God knew Moses that intricately, God knows you that well as. He's ordained every single one of your days. And he has called you to be either a son or a daughter of the most high God, a son or daughter of the king, and to one day live in the court of the king. To abide in and live with and reign with the one who had said, truly, 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 I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. And you know this one as Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. And Jesus is the great I am who causes that which was, which is now, and which will someday be. And Jesus is the great I am who came to free us all of our sins and to encourage you amid your doubts and anxieties about serving him so that just like Moses, you can know yourself as God knows you and to become that which the Lord is causing you and destined you to be. And just as the great I am lives within you, so that if and when anybody says to you, well, who do you think you are anyway? You can respond by saying, I am a child of the great I am. And I am on a mission to bring people to him. You know, some of you raise crops and livestock for a living. Perhaps God wants you to use your knowledge of planting and sowing and harvesting to sow his word into the lives of other people and be one who is a harvester of souls for God. Some of you teach our children for a living. God might want to use your skills, your abilities, and your love and passion for children to teach other people, adults included, the Word of God. Let's admit it, as adults, sometimes we act like kids. But we need people to teach us the Word of God. People that just aren't pastors. If some of you protected our nation, God needs more people to defend the cause of freedom and stand for His ways in our nation. I could go on and on 
and on. Some of you own shops and sell flowers, things that encourage people. And yet God has placed within you the gift of encouragement to encourage others. God has caused you to drill for natural resources. Maybe God wants you to drill down into people's hearts and help them find the best of themselves so that oil of the Lord, that gladness can come up. You get the point of what I am saying, correct? Some of you are retired. Many of you are retired. You have gifts, you have skills, you have abilities, you have passions that could be used. You have wisdom that could teach a younger generation how to live for the Lord with patience and grace and dignity. We ask, who am I, God? Why would you want to use me? The answer is you are a child of the Most High God who was, who is, and evermore will be. He put you on this earth not so that you could be a spectator, but so that you could enlarge his kingdom and win souls for Christ. The last thought I have as we touch down on the runway is a question that we all need to ask ourselves in closing. Am I willing to encounter the living God, Yahweh the Elohim, in a whole new way and become that which he's destined me to be. Let's pray for that. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you put us all here for a reason. You've named us. You've given us a name that means something. And more importantly, we carry the name of him, Jesus Christ, in our lives. The great I am who saved us. The great I am who redeemed us. The great I am who is sanctifying us every day in his Holy Spirit. Speak to us, Father God, in a personal way. Give us all a burning bush moment where we hear from you, where we hear your call, and where we say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Maybe we don't think we're anybody, but you think we're somebody. Help us to realize who we are in you, through Christ our Lord. Amen, and an amen, and amen, and amen.